The law of God governs the entire universe. This is the same law that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob followed. This law was codified through Moses on Mount Sinai. Today, this law is all but forgotten in America. Discover how this law can bring you either blessings or curses. Learn how this perfect law of liberty can be followed today. All right, tonight's uh, presentation is do not take God's name in vain. We're going to first try to identify what you shall not take the Lord's name in vain means. We're going to talk a little bit about covenant, judgment, and the contract penal clause. That's going to be kind of review because that was the first one. I kind of tried to lay the groundwork for all that. And I've reviewed it a lot just because it's kind of important. And then some of the statutes will be judgment and vengeance. And then we're going to talk about all the punishments in the scripture. Blasphemy, witchcraft, backsliding, reproof, repentance, and prophets all fit under punishments. So if you want to know how I categorize things, you shall not take the name of the Lord in vain, deals with discipline. Uh, then we're going to talk about the curse of the law. Okay, before we begin, I always like to start with this slide. I know it's repetitive, but the law of God is good for us. We always need to remember that. Uh, it's for our good always that he might preserve us alive as it is this day. Uh, the law of God defines righteous living. It doesn't give us our righteousness. That was the mistake they made in the Old Testament. It defines it. That's sanctification. The only way to understand God's law is to do God's law. Psalm 111.10 is one of my favorite verses. A good understanding of all they that do his commandments. And James said the same thing. Um, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. When studying the law of God, we err when we treat it as a religion. That is one of my, if you've ever talked to me, that's one of my most important things. We really, Satan's biggest distraction is religion. I was just talking to Mark about that outside before, before we came in. It is a law, it needs to be studied as law. We have always looked at it as a legal system up until about 100 years ago. Then it started turning into a religion. And that's been one of Satan's tricks for uh, thousands of years, is to just pervert his law by turning it into religion. Israel was a nation, not a church. We need to compare Israel with other nations. The law of God is a national law. So instead of comparing Israel to what we call the church today, we're going to compare Israel to America. And it will give us a slightly different perspective. And then finally, the law of God is compared to a mirror and should be used to look back at yourself, not towards others. It's the perfect law of liberty. That's, that's, what, that's what James meant by that. It's for us to look at ourselves. It's self-government. But I hope we understood that that's, that's the intent God wants us to have, to have the freedom to choose to practice His law. Uh, when I study the law, there, well, this is just my count, and I, I would never get picky about this, but there's 756 commandments, statutes, and judgments. They're all codified in 87 titles of law. And those 87 titles of law fit somewhere under the Ten Commandments, which fit somewhere under the two greatest commandments, just like Jesus said. Uh, love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. That's the way Jesus organized it. That's the way I decided to when I went through a study. And I'm going to say it again. This is not correct. This is, I think, the model. And I'm constantly changing it and tweaking it and messing with it. And it's been really neat to try and learn it this way because categorizing everything just really help, helps to understand. Uh, the first five relate to our relationship with God. And the last five relate to our relationship with uh, each other. And that fifth one, honor your father and your mother, is kind of the connecting link between the two. Because your parents are your first God-given authority. So where, where these are all related to God, that fifth one is how God connected us to the rest of the planet, the rest of the world. 
So uh, that's how I started organizing it once I came to that revelation. The first three surprised me. Those are almost all government. When you go through the statutes, it's almost all government. Uh, we use them, some of them are religious terms today, but the reality is it's government, and we just don't see it because we've redefined some of these words. Uh, the first lesson, we went through faith in the law of the land, and we identified that God's law is supposed to be the law of the land of every nation. It's established by faith. Second lesson, we went through all the offerings. You can't really see what highlighted there, but all the offerings in the second lesson. The third lesson we went through the priesthood, both those two related to the tabernacle and how the judicial system worked. The fifth lesson was just kind of putting everything together, a whole bunch from three different uh, commandments. Uh, it was a little bit unorganized, but I wanted to get through those. And then finally today, we're going to look at you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Okay, this is mostly the punishment, the curses, and how God deals with sin. You shall not take the name of God in vain. What does this mean? This is not swearing. We make that mistake. For some reason, religious, religion turned it that way. It has nothing to do with swearing. The Strong's Dictionary tells you pretty clearly... Take is the Hebrew word nasa, which means to lift, bear up, carry, or take. It has nothing to do with what we're saying or speaking. Vain is emptiness, vanity, or falsehood. This is bearing God's name in falsehood or vanity or emptiness. That's what it has to do with. Now, not that I'm endorsing swearing or using God's name in vain the way we traditionally have looked at it, but this is really it has nothing to do with swearing. What it has to do with is ambassadorship. How serious we are with our covenant with God. This is a very serious commandment. God will not forgive those who break this command. I don't know if we ever made that connection. He said, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that takes his name in vain. This is the unforgivable commandment. The Messiah called this the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. What did Jesus mean when he said that? First, here's the context. Then was brought unto him one possessed with a devil. So the Messiah healed a man possessed with a demon. The Pharisees said it was done by the power of Satan. Right? This fellow does cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. Then Jesus immediately went into a kingdom divided against itself will not stand. Why is he talking about a kingdom divided against itself? He that is not with me is against me. So now it's someone who's against him. And then he says all sin can be forgiven except the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Blasphemy is the Greek, uh, the Greek word blasphemia, which means vilification, defamation, slander, evil, evil, speaking, or railing. And the Hebrew word means to scorn, despise, or abhor. So blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, or blaspheming God, is to scorn Him, despise Him, or abhor Him. That's pretty serious. It's not just saying His name badly or incorrectly. If you were like me as a kid, I thought I, I was worried about this when I first got saved. Did I say it? Did I do it? Was that the one time I let it slip? It has nothing to do with that. Blasphemy is what we call treason today. It's almost the exact same definition. Turning your back on God and switching sides. Here's what treason means. It's the offense of attempting to overthrow the government of the state to which the offender owes allegiance. Or of betraying the state into the hands of a foreign power. Is that not what the Pharisees did? Treason against the United States shall consist only in levying war against them or in adhering to their enemies, giving them aid and comfort. Do, do you see where I'm going with this? Treason and blasphemy in the scripture are, are kind of saying the exact same thing. This is a very serious crime to God. In Hebrews 6, he says, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away, to renew them again unto repentance. This is also blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. If you look at it as the consequence, 
instead of all the other details, this is the unforgivable sin. God's not going to forgive us if we commit this, this sin. Because what is it? It is also a very serious crime in every nation today. It's a traitor. The punishment of a traitor is death. So even every nation today takes this very seriously. That's what Judas did. He committed treason. Which is why there was no repentance found for him. Judas betrayed the Messiah. Remember what he said? And I will deliver him unto you. And they covenanted for 30 pieces of silver. Judas was actually called a traitor. What's the definition of a traitor? One guilty of treason. So Judas committed treason. Judas wanted to repent, but he couldn't. What did Jesus say? It had been good for that man if he had never been born. There's no repentance for him. But did he try? He sought it, but it was over. That, that, that covenant was severed. He had a covenant, and then he said, no, I don't want it. You guys, none of us have ever done that. Sometimes I used to worry about this commandment, but I, we've never done that. I have never. I, I've fallen away. I've, this is different than backsliding. This is literally saying, I'm out, I'm on the other side. And so this is actually even more extreme than when Moses misrepresented God. Yes, that, yes. That, that was a mistake. God can forgive mistakes. This is literally receiving salvation and knowing God and tasting all those things Hebrew said and then saying, you know what, I don't want it. I'm, I think I'm going to go on Satan's side. Or, you know, whatever, however you want to put it. That's what the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is. If you start to connect all the pieces and connect it to the fact that it's the unforgivable sin. There's an unforgivable sin in the third commandment. This is switching sides willingly. When you know, you've, you've tasted that, and then you decide, I'm going to the other team. There's, there's, I don't think there's a lot of people that have done that. Judas did it. I think the Pharisees did it. Jim Jones did it. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> we probably count all the people we can actually name is, is going to be a small list. Yeah. Treason. If you look, you look at it this way, the Pharisees committed treason. Remember? They were the rulers of Israel. They should have known. But they sold out their Messiah anyways. Of all the people that should have known, it should have been them. They had it. They had everything given. They, they had it all. All the scriptures, everything. And they sold them out anyways. Judas committed treason. We just went over that. Judas was a disciple. He walked with him for three years. Maybe only 70 weeks. A little debatable. Yeah. But he walked with him. He was right there. And he sold him out also. This is treason. That's what this commandment means, in my opinion. This is switching sides after the commitment, after the covenant. Once you make that covenant, you really can't go back. This has nothing to do with backsliding. Breaking covenant. Yes, it's saying I'm out of the covenant. I want. If we were, uh, it, we're, we're in America, right? If we decided to fight a war against America with Afghanistan, or some other nation, or Iran, or whoever, that's treason. You're never going to be allowed back. All of our nation follow God's principle that he set forth in the third commandment. Just about everyone. Are we taking God's name in vain? Well, are you at war with God? Are you actively plotting against God? Then I don't think we have anything to worry about this command because we're obviously here for a reason. This, this is someone different and, and it's probably a lot more rare than we think but under this commandment fit all the disciplines so it, not every not every uh, discipline that's in the scripture is going to uh, be uh, exactly the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit that's just one of them but that's what that commandment means in my opinion uh, we need to remember that we are in covenant with God all this is based on our covenant remember when we talked about covenant or contract there's four elements to all contracts according to every law book you'll ever look at. There's an offer with an acceptance. There's a time limit and then there's consideration. So this is review. The new covenant, God made the offer, remember? At the Last Supper, He said this is the blood of the new covenant, the New Testament. Then the apostles accepted when they drank of it. The time is forever. It says over and over again, this is an everlasting covenant. And I think you can connect this right back to the Abrahamic covenant of promise. That's where it really started, or was it was at least first defined. And the consideration is what? Well, it's our obedience. If you love me, keep my commandments. It's the same consideration that the old covenant has. 
And God's discipline, that's His job. So we're in contract with God. We need to be obe obedient to Him. And He's going to either bless us or curse us to discipline us and teach us and train us into His law. For whom the Lord loves, He chastens and scourges every son whom He receives. This is the New Testament quoting the Old Testament. So the consideration is the same thing in the New Testament or the New Covenant that was in the Old Covenant. Or He wouldn't be quoting the same verses for the New Covenant. But God provides a helper in the New Testament, which I, I always have a hard time identifying this. The Holy Spirit was in the Old Testament too. But we have the Holy Spirit to teach us all things. In fact, Ezekiel said he would put his spirit within us. Why? So that he would cause us to walk in my statutes and he shall keep my judgments and do them. The Holy Spirit's job is to teach us how to be obedient. And obedience is based on God's law. So this is why I'm always saying we have grace to learn God's law, not grace to break it. Once we change that mindset, all of a sudden it's like, now I know where I'm going. And then it'll change your mind to think, I shouldn't be judging others. I should be just worried about myself. Because everyone's at a different spot and we're learning. God, God's writing His law in our heart. And I have no idea what law He's writing on Chauncey's heart compared to mine. And what, where He's got him growing and learning. And that's none of my business. We're going to learn when it is my business in a minute. But uh, for the most part, it isn't my business. Uh, it provided the payment for sin. He is the propitiation for our sins. I know this is review, but was for the house of Israel and Judah. And Gentiles could be grafted in. And likewise, Israelites could be grafted out. Contains the Torah. That's what's forgotten a lot today. A hundred years ago, everybody knew that. It wasn't a secret. If you, I, my favorite commentaries on the scripture are old ones. I liked it like two, three hundred years ago. They're the best. And they never deny God's law. Never. You know, it's only a recent thing. We accepted the covenant by faith. If you accepted the covenant, then you should take it seriously. That's what the third commandment means. We are to take that covenant seriously. We made a contract with God. We agreed. Whenever we accepted it by faith, we agreed. So we should take it seriously. And I think that's really where the third commandment's going. There's a contract penalty clause which is related to this third commandment. And this is also review. A penal clause is a secondary obligation. This is why Galatians is misunderstood. Entered into for the purpose of enforcing the performance of a primary obligation. It's a secondary obligation. A penal clause in an agreement supposes two obligations, one of which is the principal and the other is conditional. So there's a principal obligation and a conditional. A penalty always includes two distinct engagements, and when the first is fulfilled, the second is void. When the first is fulfilled, the second is void. That's key. The penalties are void if the first is fulfilled. If we would have fulfilled the first, there would have been no penalties. Now, we didn't, but who fulfilled it for us? Jesus. So we still get out of the penalties. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. He didn't redeem us from practicing the law. He redeemed us from the curse of the law. Wherefore then serves the law? It was added because of transgressions. Galatians chapter 3 is talking about the curse of the law, not the law. I know this is review because we did this before, but it's a secondary obligation. God's law contains two separate contracts. If we keep the first one, the second is void. The penal laws, penal laws is, is exactly what we've been saying. Those laws which prohibit an act and impose a penalty for the commission of it. That's two different laws. We do that in law today. There's a law that says you shall wear your seatbelt when driving. There's no penalty for me yet. But when I break that law, what happens? There's a secondary obligation, a secondary law that is now imposed on me and I need to pay it. Does that make sense? This is a separate law. It's two distinct laws. And you, have to, you can look at the context and see which ones Paul is referring to. That's one of the reasons Paul was very misunderstood. Peter even quoted saying, hey, some of this stuff's hard to get. This is why. He was a lawyer. He understood, you know how law really functions and we don't think like that today a hundred years ago people in America did there's two obligations the first obligation is to keep God's commandments statutes and judgments that's our job when we break it the second obligation is conditional if we break God's commandments we receive a penalty so those are the two laws if you've ever spoken to me about it I, I say that a lot it, Galatians is one of the best books in the world wherefore then serves the law 
It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come. What law do you add because of breaking the law? The the penalties. penalties. Yeah. So God's law traces all the way back to the Garden of Eden. When did he add the penalties? Mosaic. Well, that's where he codified it, but I believe Genesis 3. The curse. Right there, he added the law. Then he clarified it through Moses when he codified it. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that continues not in all things which are written in the book of the law. What's the difference between the book of the law and the curse of the law here? You, 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 you're talking about the law and the penalties. There's two distinct obligations. Okay, until we look at Galatians that way, we're not really going to quite get it. And a lot of times we see, well, this is nomos, that means law. It's got to be the Ten Commandments. No, his context is clearly the curses, the penalties of the law. We're not under the law. I'm not under the, I'm not, I am not under the United States law right now. If I drive home and I speed and I get a ticket, now I'm under the law. I have to go pay the penalty. Do you see the difference in we're talking about under law, under grace? We're not under the law, under the curse of the law, under the penalties. Someone paid it for us, so we're now under grace. We have grace that we, we, we're now forgiven. Do, does that kind of make sense? I'm adding a little more to when I taught this before just to try to um, help clarify some of these things. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. You guys remember the definition of schoolmaster, right? It's not what we think it means. Strong's Dictionary says it's a boy leader, a servant whose office it was to take the children to school. Easton's Bible Dictionary says the word does not mean teacher, but pedagogue, i.e. the one who is entrusted with the supervision of a family, taking them to and from the school, being responsible for the safety and manners. Hence, the pedagogue was stern and severe in his discipline. So this is the curse of the law, Galatians chapter 3 still, disciplining us till we find the Messiah. That it shows us how we need the Messiah because he, it's disciplining us. We're receiving curses. We're realizing we're, we're not doing it right. The Messiah is a picture of the law. So we need to uh, just recognize what Paul's talking about. This is the contract penal clause of the Mosaic Law, uh, which is why the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient. Wait, the Ten Commandments aren't made for righteous? Should, should the righteous person follow the Ten Commandments? No, the penalties aren't made for the righteous person. I've got friends that used to, because you guys know how much, I'm really into the Levitical priesthood, and they say, wow, well, gosh, if we were doing that, I'd be at the temple every day slaughtering animals, because I sin so much. The reality is you wouldn't. You'd be going to the temple as often as you go to court today. It's for the unrighteous, the people who are committing sins. You know, breaking God's commandments. And that would be one of the codified commandments, not our thoughts. Um, we'll get to thoughts when we get to the Ten Command Tenth Commandment. But it's a little different than what we think. Breach of contract. That's where we're at now. It's the non-performance of any covenant agreed to be performed or the doing of an act covenanted not to be done. That's our position in America today. We're in breach of contract. We've broken God's law. And we're receiving some curses. That's what this, uh, the, the Third Commandment is really about. This penal clause. So we need to remember that God still punishes sin. The first statute is vengeance. There's two statutes under here. Vengeance is the punishment inflicted in retaliation for an injury or offense. You shall not take vengeance for yourself is what the scripture says. Thou shalt not avenge yourself. It's not my job to avenge me. It's someone else's job. The Lord will take vengeance for you. To me belongs vengeance, for the Lord shall judge his people. What is this referring to? There are two types of punishments in the scripture. Judgment executed by the Levitical priesthood. Before, and he shall stand before the congregation in judgment. There's 14 punishments, at least that I found, uh, related to the Levitical priesthood. And then there's judgment executed by God himself. These you would commonly call the curses. We call it an act of God today. Okay, we used to believe in acts of God. We don't believe that anymore. This is, you know, some people would call it karma. The scripture calls it reaping what you sow. Uh, if any misadventure or casualty is said to be caused by the act of God when it happens by the direct, immediate, and exclusive operation of the forces of nature. Okay, we have this in our law books because we believed it used to be a penalty. 
is it still a penalty? Or are we just not quite understanding it? There are seven punishments under this type of punishment. So there's 14 under the Levitical priesthood that they would hand out, that man would hand out. And there's seven that God will hand out directly himself. This is God's vengeance. He can take vengeance or punish sin through the Levitical priesthood or directly. If, if you look at how the scripture says so. So it's not for me to take vengeance on myself. Today we'd call this taking the law into your own hands. It's not my job to take the law into my own hands. America did this early. We had lynch mobs. Oh, he stole a horse. We're going to skip trial. We're just going to get 15 guys, cover our heads, and go hang them. That, that's not what God said to do. There's a legal system to use. And, you know, it, it's something we're supposed to use. So we're not to take the law into our own hands. Punishments in the scripture are called judgments. So this is the next title. A judgment is the final consideration and determination of a court of competent jurisdiction upon the matter submitted to it. Okay, a judgment is something a court determines in whatever matter that's brought before them. There's five statutes under judgment, at least five that I counted. God will punish sin. We always need to remember that. And I'm going to compare it to the common law because I just, the connections are amazing. There's a common law maxim that says it concerns the commonwealth that crimes do not remain unpunished. We don't believe that in America anymore. We let crimes go all the time. Evil deeds ought not to remain unpunished for impunity affords continual excitement to the delinquent. If you let someone get away and give them impunity for their crimes or their sins, they're going to keep doing it. And this, th these maxims come straight from the scripture. A punishment inflicted on a few causes a dread to all. The scripture says, and all Israel shall hear and fear in relationship to a, to, to a punishment. So in America, we're not doing that. We're letting people, we're, we're, I guess they, the term, we're just slapping them on the wrist and letting them go. We're not giving the harsh penalties that the scripture actually says, which is why America's uh, in the position we're in today. The purpose for punishment is to deter sin. That's the whole point. Ignorance of the law is no excuse. That's the second one. Okay? Sin through ignorance, you're still found guilty, and you pay the sacrifice or the fine. All right. Common law maxim, maxim says ignorance of the law excuses not. All these maxims from the common law you can find in the scripture. It really is amazing. Every man shall be accountable for his own sins. The father shall not be put to death for the children, neither shall the children be put to death for the fathers. Every man shall be put to death for his own sins. Common law says no one is to be punished for the crime or wrong of another. God judges, rewards, and punishes every man according to his works. So based on how we behave, how we act, according to that covenant, that contract, that's how God's going to judge us. And God will punish us seven times more if we do not heed his discipline. And even, the Kamala even agrees with that. The increase of punishment should be in proportion to the increase of crime. We don't do that in America either. Punishments are given as judgments. This is given either by the Levitical priesthood or God himself. Here are the punishments for the Levitical priesthood. So I've got 21 punishments that I found in the scripture, and they're split up 14 and 7. So try to remember that, because we're going to do 14, then we're going to do a lot, and then we're going to come back to the last 7. Alright, there's 21 statutes under punishments. The Levitical priesthood, remember, it's the judicial system. It's the judicial system of the Bible. And thou shalt come unto the priests and the Levites and the judges that shall be in those days and inquire. And they shall show you the sentence of judgment. And thou shalt do according to the sentence. This is how God, God's going to work through our judicial system. Gave punishments at the mouth of two or three witnesses, so there is always a trial. When found guilty, the punishment would be given. So they always have to be found guilty. So you can catch all the clues in there that this is a trial going on. The first three I put up there are stoning, burning, and hanging. These are all the capital punishments that are listed in the scripture that I could find. There might be another one, but those are the three most common. There's 24 capital felonies. Adultery, fraudulent marriage, rape, 
bestiality, incest, homosexuality, idol worship, blasphemy, breaking the Sabbath, witchcraft, false prophets, passing your seed through the fire to Moloch, strangers serving in the tabernacle, striking, cursing parents, juvenile delinquency, murder, man-stealing, negligent homicide, ignoring a judge's sentence, perjury for capital cases, a priest's daughter who is a prostitute, sexual relations with a mother and daughter, and treason. How many of those do you think America does? A oh. lot. No, I mean, how many of those do you think we actually assign a capital felony for? Oh, oh, oh. I, 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 I came up with two. Can you see another one? Is there another one up there? Or is it just murder and treason are the only two that we give a capital felony for? Or don't we just kind of ignore the rest? Yeah. That was last week. <laughs> I'm not going to try and explain it without a slide. At least my opinion. At least my opinion. It's a little different. Uh, we've all done that, in my opinion. Every, everybody. And, um, but how many are we guilty of here? We're guilty of a lot more capital felonies than we think. Sabbath breaking. I know I, I definitely used to do it before eight years ago, and I'm sure I have a couple of times since. You just think of all these uh, uh, capital felonies. There's probably a couple up there that we've done. Excommunication. Whoever shall commit any of these abominations, even that souls that commit them, shall be cut off from his people. Cut off is karat, which means to cut off, down or asunder, by implication to destroy or consume, spe specifically to covenant. You know when the Bible says to make a covenant? That's the word for make. It literally means to cut a covenant. That's where I connected the burn offering to covenant from. Uh, you can trace those words uh, back uh, by cutting it in pieces. This is the termination of the covenant. We would call this expatriation or banishment or exile today. Okay, it's, it's what the Bible calls excommunication. When a person is expatriated from their country, their covenant of citizenship is revoked and they are banished from all benefits in that country. So that's, what, that's the fourth punishment I found, excommunication. We're just using the wrong word today. It's, it's expatriation, banishment, or exile in our law books. It matches the same thing. So when you're excommunicated, what would happen? You no longer have a relationship with the country that you, you live in. Or they might actually send you away. That's what an exile would be. Scourging and fines or sacrifices. Those are used to deter sin. We don't do, well we do the fines. We don't do scourging or sacrifices. I think we should. People think I'm crazy to say it, but... If, if you're driving down the freeway and you get a ticket and you're, you have to pay a fine by buying a lamb, killing it, slaughtering it on the offer, uh, altar, and paying your fine, you're not going to do it again. I thought you meant, you know, the cop pulls you out and scourges you. <laughs> um, that too. But I was going with the Levitical priesthood like I've been for Levitical most of this. <laughs> The city of refuge we don't do either. Then you shall appoint you cities to be cities of refuge for you, that the slayer, someone who commits manslaughter, uh, which kills any person unaware, so this is an accidental killing, and they shall be unto you cities for refuge from the avenger, that the manslayer die not until he stand before the congregation in judgment. So someone who accidentally kills someone, he gets to go to a city to protect him, so that the revenger of blood does not, kill him, does not go after him, until trial. Would if he's found guilty... Thing, would our closest thing to that be prison? Even though I know kind of. Really the, protective custody. Yeah, yeah protective custody. Really, yeah, it's not really equivalent. There's, no, there's not a whole lot of freedom in it, but yeah. the idea is you're, you're getting away from the person that's trying to kill you so that you have safety. Uh, when they're found guilty, if, if they're found guilty, obviously they'd get the, the penalty, but if they're found innocent, they'd stay in that city until the high priest dies and then they can go back. So that's what the city of refuge is. We really aren't doing it today. There's some resemblance of it. Uh, release of slaves for oppression. They shall let him go for his eye's sake. So if you have a slave, and we don't practice slavery today, he shall let him go if he hurts his eye or if he causes physical damage like hurts his tooth. So that's a punishment also to a slave owner. 
Um, slavery is not like we think slavery. It's really more bond servitude. It's strict liability versus limited liability. Strict liability means you're paying for it yourself. You become someone's slave to pay a debt. And that teaches you something. It, it's accountability which we don't have in our law today. What we did in America, I would never endorse. That was kidnapping, though. No, that was not slavery. And it really wasn't slavery that we practiced. It was kidnapping. And uh, we'll that get to was, that. That was a capital punishment. Uh, yes. So we, we didn't need to change any of our laws. And if you look into it, the laws we changed weren't very good anyways. Then a ransom. I actually kind of like this one. But <laughs> let's say you commit, a cr not a crime, but negligence. Uh, the example given here, if an ox were want to push, uh, you've got to like the King James word, but they were uh, butting you or hitting you with their horns. And you knew it, but you didn't lock it up. And then it went and killed somebody. You're supposed to die with the ox. But you can put a ransom out there to the, to the injured party and say, hey, I'll give you this much money if you can spare my life. Or whatever property or whatever it is. And the determination is based on the injured party. They get to decide, no, I'd rather watch you die. It'll make me feel better. <laughs> or, yes, you've got a million dollars. I'll take that. You know, it, 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 it's, it's either way. But it, it's, um, it's a way to get out of a death penalty for negligence. Because, uh, you know what, if, if we need to be responsible for the property that we have and uh, injuring someone else. Pastor, you mentioned it the other day about the rail. You know, it's not relevant today, but the reality, if we have a balcony, we need to put a rail or we're responsible. And uh, all those fit under negligence, not, you know, just putting a rail on all of our roofs. Because if you go by the letter, we're all guilty of that. Yeah. Well, I shouldn't say that. Maybe some of you do have a rail on your roof, but most of us in California don't. To me, that's the beauty of the common law and the Torah. If you have a judge who knows how to construe it, you don't need a complicated law. We've put so many laws into the books that it's just making it too complicated for everyday people to just try and understand, which is why we all hire lawyers, and they don't even get it right half the time. But God's law, if you construe it correctly, it fits every situation. There's nothing that doesn't work. During the millennium, well, we're going to get back to the basics. Yes, we are. When, when, when the Messiah is ruling and reigning as king, we're going to do everything exactly right. And... The letter's good, but you have to interpret the letter by the Spirit. And that depends on the situation. The Spirit of the law. Remember what the, the law book said? The Spirit of the law is the intent and purpose of the lawmaker. What is the intention of putting a rail on your roof? So someone doesn't get injured. That's the whole point. So this is negligence. Did you cause an injury to someone? That's what really matters. Cutting off your hand, you got to love the King James. What if, if, if someone takes him by the secrets... <laughs> or, um, it's, it's, it's an, yeah, it's a King James. You know, you shall cut off her hand if someone does that. So God's very cautious of reproduction to the point of damaging. Um, we laugh at those things, but the reality is, you know, he takes those things serious. Right. Our, our progeny, our reproduction, our, our family lineage is very important and should be. And family should be important to us. And if you do anything to damage the possibility of that towards somebody, um, that's quite a damage. That, that's, that's pretty serious if you think about it. Yeah, true. <laughs> but I'd be more, per personally, I would miss not having kids. Having two kids myself, you don't know it. I didn't know it until I had kids. But now that I have them, it's like that. I, I, I wouldn't give that up for just about anything. So uh, I can understand the, the reason for this. Forced marriage, this is where we get the term shotgun marriage. But if we did this today, if we did this today, it would solve a lot of our... Sexual immorality. Uh, but if you sleep with a virgin, you have to marry her. Pay the bride price. The father can reject it if he wants to. But you also can't put her away or divorce her forever. Your whole life. Can you imagine how serious that would be? We'd have a lot more marriages. P people would think about it. <laughs> people would you, would you would think about it. It'd be a lot more serious. And that would probably solve a lot of our... Uh, adultery and fornication going on in, the, in America today. Restitution. 
It's simply an eye for an eye, tooth for tooth. If I cause someone to damage, I need to make that person whole, is the way the common law puts it. So whatever I damage, that's all that phrase, is the spirit of the law. How often do you really gouge someone's eye out? It's not talking about that. It's when you damage someone's property, you make it whole. If I crash my car into someone, I don't, hey, let's just go to Mako and get it fixed. No, you need to get it fixed right. You know, you need to, whatever it takes to get it right, because that person deserves to be Are made you whole. The yes. I, 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 I love Mako, but I have old cars. And when I'm paying, Mako's the best. But um, under normal situations, if, if you crash into a Ferrari or a really nice car, yeah. they're going to want it right. Yeah, nice. And it's going to be a thousand something, you know, several thousand dollars to fix that, that paint job. And uh, that's what the spirit of this law is. It's not just you knock out someone's tooth, although literally if that happens, you would need to pay the dentist bill to get it fixed. But uh, the reality is you need to make that person whole. That's how the common law puts it. And that's simply what it means. Make the person whole. Fix whatever you caused back as it was new. And the 14th one is jail. This is not prison. Jail was until you found out the sentence. I haven't found anything to endorse prisons in the scripture. How can that person pay their fine or pay their penalty when they're in prison? And God's whole system is based on rectifying wrongs, fixing damages. If there's an injury to someone, that gets fixed. If they go to prison, they can't fix it. So that's where slavery came in, which is why it's a good thing. It's strict liability is what you would call it today. So in place of prisons, slavery. Yes. Or death. That, or, or, death. Death. or death. Slavery or death, depending or on the penalty. Most prison penalties should have been death. death. Yes, you're right. Should have been death. And we're afraid to do that for some reason. But the reality is the common law is a very harsh and brutal law. God's law is a very harsh and brutal law. If we were doing it today, there'd be a lot less sin in America. Sure, there might be a tragic story where you think of a juvenile delinquent that had to die, but that's one compared to all of them going astray in America today. Just about. And sometimes it's that one that puts that fear in the eyes of everybody else to realize. And uh, that's kind of how the common law works. That's how God's law works. It's very harsh. It's very brutal. But it fixes the nation. In the millennium, that's how, God, that's how the Messiah is going to straighten out the world. It's going to be strict and harsh. And it's probably going to be very quick until everybody gets in line. Because you're going to recognize, I'm not going to do that because that guy just died. Yeah. You know, and I don't want that to happen to me. <laughs> okay, blasphemy is a capital felony. All right, there's three statutes that I found. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. We already went over that because that's the head statute. This is not swearing. It is ambassadorship. We need to take that seriously. We need to take our covenant with God seriously. And unfortunately, I don't think America, most of America is. Cursing or blasphemy against the Lord is forbidden. Neither shalt thou profane the name of God. We have similar laws in America today. Did you know you can't threaten the president? You can't verbally threaten him. And a lot of people you know, don't know that today. He, he, <laughs> yeah. I think if they thought it was a real threat, this would come into play. But we have similar laws. God is our king. We're not supposed to take his name in vain. We're not supposed to profane his name. Some examples... Speaking evil against God, I already went over this with the first one. Breaking your word or your vow with God. That's why he takes it so seriously. And represent, misrepresenting God maliciously. Our law books define blasphemy to attribute to God that which is contrary to his nature and does not belong to him and to deny what does. Or it is a false reflection uttered with a malicious design of reviling God. You know, it's not just spouting his name in anger. This is malicious design of reviling God. Profane is kalal, that's the Hebrew word, to wound, to dissolve, to break one's word. So we're not to break one's word with God's name. This is swearing by His name. So it, 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 it has to do with covenant, having, having to do with contract. This means to dissolve the covenant by breaking it. That's why it's a capital felony. We're walking away from God. The blasphemer is to be put to death. So it's a death penalty. Same is true in the United States. Our Constitution says it. Whoever owing allegiance to the United States and levies war against them or adheres to their enemies shall suffer death. So it's a death penalty in America as well.
Witchcraft is a result of blasphemy. I don't know if you've ever looked at it that way. Witchcraft is intercourse with evil spirits. That's what Black's Law Dictionary says. Communication with evil spirits. Intercourse is not what we use today. It's just communicating and fellowship with evil spirits. That's the way it meant in Old English. Witchcraft has three statutes. You shall not practice witchcraft. That's the first one. We already knew that. Um, these are the, this is the list of what witchcraft is. Divination, observer of times, enchanter, witch, a charmer, familiar spirits, a wizard, a, a necromancer. All those are uh, witchcraft. Divination is a lot. Oracle, witchcraft, divine sentence or divination. Observer of times is an enchanter, a moanemon, observe time, soothsayer, sorcerer. An enchanter is to practice divination, observe signs, diligently observe, observe practice fortune telling, take as an omen. Witch is to whisper a spell to enchant or practice magic. A charmer is a spell, a charmer, company, enchantment. Familiar spirit is a necromancer, a familiar spirit. A wizard is knowing one specifically, a conjurer or a wizard. A necromancer to seek or ask specifically to worship. Do you see the connection with all these? Mm -hmm. All these are an attempt to communicate with evil spirits. That's the whole point. Uh, how does God speak to us today though? Well, he uses the scripture, prophets, st a still small voice, Holy Spirit, angels, sometimes dreams and visions. There's lots of different ways, but it's never with a familiar spirit. It's never through witchcraft. We should never seek those things. You shall not observe times. You shall not observe times. Does that sound familiar? What times does God endorse? His appointed times. He has appointed times, right? Sabbath, Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, feast of weeks, feast of trumpets, day of atonement, and feast of tabernacles. Those are God's times. Yes. What are these observing of times that witchcraft does? Halloween. Yeah, well, the, the witchcraft, believe it or not, has a lot to do with oh, observing so times. Solstice. Yes. Three times a year, we're supposed to go before the Lord to His feast days to appear before the Lord. To communicate with the Lord. To seek after Him. We're communicating with Him. Witchcraft does the same thing. Yeah. Witchcraft has holy days. It's to meet with these evil spirits. Yeah. Those holy days, the pagan holy days, are riddled with the spirit of Christmas? What is the spirit of Christmas? Is it, is it scripture? No. Is it God? Solstice. You know, it, it, it's something different. But there's a midwinter Yule, that's Christmas. Valley's blot is Valentine's Day, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. The vernal equinox is a star, that's Easter. Uh, all of these, it, birthdays is actually the highest holy day for a witch or a warlock. Birthdays are really? Where do you, the, the incense and the astrology on the witch's cone hat and all the. Yeah, the, 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 yeah, it's. it's not known. Also by the Church of Satan. A high holy oh, is it? And birthday cakes were cakes to the Queen of Heaven. Yeah. That's where it all came from. Wow. We'll, we'll probably, this is going to be a little controversial next week when we talk about the feasts. Some of you know my opinion on these and we're a little more strict than others. But um, we have to be careful with other appointed times. We really do. I would never tell someone, you should never do that. Um, but it, it, it's something you always have to at least be careful of because witchcraft is very prevalent on all these days. So the, jo so the JWs are right about birthdays, but not celebrating birthdays. I actually agree with them on it. Yeah. Huh. I do. Um, no. Some of the holy days that aren't as clear, and we're going to actually talk about this next week. Um, it, clearly the New Testament says not to judge anyone in their keeping of holy days. So we, I would never have that attitude, but I think evil spirits are out and around on these days. Yes. Uh, I would say on your birthday, there's someone's tracking you. Someone's around you. And we should be at least cautious of that. This, this is a personal decision everybody needs to make. Some people I know, they just make it very light. And that's probably okay. And I, I wouldn't say that. we. Rochelle and I got very strict on ours because we came to believe in God's law when Samantha was born. And immediately we thought, well, we need to stop Christmas. Because if we start, it's going to be hard to take it away from her. If we let her get to five or six and she's been doing it all this time and then say, nope, no more, that's going to be a hard decision. That's not going to be an easy thing to do. So we decided to just kind of go cold turkey and stop everything. But I don't know if that's what's right for everybody because talking to people, you know, some people just make birthdays very light. 
and that's probably okay. It's you know it, it's whatever you've prayed about and think God's leading you to. Yeah, it's it's definitely a selfish yeah. holiday, yeah. at least yeah. by the world standard. Yeah. But it doesn't have to be, so right. you don't have to do it that way. Yeah. But um, I'll probably talk a little more about that next week. But again, it's not something to judge somebody by. It's just thoughts to consider. The death penalty is for witchcraft, but can you see the connection between blasphemy and witchcraft? If blasphemy is treason, where you're leaving God and going somewhere, where are you going? To another spirit, to another God, to another something. Blasphemy is leaving God. Witchcraft is accepting a new one. Is is you know, and and you can read all about some of the people Saul and dealing with witchcraft and some of the issues he had in the script. Uh, they had in the scriptures. Backsliding is different than blasphemy. It's not the same thing. A totally different category. That we do that. I don't think anyone here has committed the unpardonable sin. You know, I don't worry about that anymore. But backsliding is different. Here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Backsliding is meshuba, which means to turn away. It's, you know, taking God's name in vain is unforgivable. This is blasphemy or treason against God. This is intentional. You're purposely doing it. Backsliding usually isn't. It's forgivable. This is ignorantly turning away from God or accidentally turning from God. This is unintentional. Now that, that's not to say we don't know something sin and still do it because we're struggling with it. But our mind hasn't changed on it. You know, that's what I'm convinced is the difference. When I sin, it's like, oh, I know it's sin, and I still agree it's sin, but I'm trying to stop, and I'm working on it. There's, there's, a, there's, there's a clear difference. You shall not turn away from the Lord your God, turning away neither to the left or to the right. That's the first one. Backsliding from God causes punishment and loss of blessings. Backsliding will eventually lead to national captivity. If you go through the curses, that's what it mentions. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens. God deals with you as with his son. You shall not cause or tempt others to backslide. That's a pretty serious one right there. What did, what did the Messiah say? But whoso shall offend one of these little ones, he'd be better to have a millstone hung around his neck. So someone who's purposely doing that, it, it's a different category. It's a different level. Uh, when someone is backsliding and sinning against you, you are to reprove them. This one we don't really do. We're kind of afraid to for some reason. You shall not suffer sin upon yourself. Did you know God does not want you to suffer from someone else's sin? This is a different mindset. We used to have it a couple hundred years ago. Suffer means to lift, bear up, carry, take, to bear, uh, support, sustain. Um, we are not to suffer from someone else's sin. This is what the common law would call a tort. A tort is a legal wrong committed upon the person or property independent of contract. A tort in common law jurisdiction is a civil wrong that unfairly causes someone else to suffer loss or harm, resulting in legal liability for the person who commits the tortious act. It causes a damage. Loss, injury, or deterioration caused by the negligence, design, or accident of one person to another in respect of the latter person's property. So tort law is all about fixing damages. If there's no damage caused, you have no action in court. That's why it's the perfect law of liberty. Think about it this way, you guys. We have the freedom to live our lives how we desire. If we cause someone to damage, then we have to pay. Do you see the freedom in this law? The guidelines for payment are simple. Life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. We need to make them right. However it is, we need to make them right. So should I worry about someone's sin if it didn't damage me? No. If someone's breaking a commandment and it doesn't damage me, it really doesn't have, it's none of my business. If they want to talk about it, I might talk about it. But if it didn't cause me any harm, I, I have no action against them. But the other part of this commandment says, you shall reprove and admonish one another to prevent sin. We don't do that. This is accountability. We're afraid to do that. Anyone, you hear the term, you know, afraid of conflict or not, not interested? We're afraid to do that today. Says, don't judge, don't God, God, well, there, there's a fine line to that. If, but if, if you've been injured, you should say something. You should do something. If we don't hold each other accountable, then sin will grow. The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. It's one of my favorite quotes from Edmund Burke. 
If we don't do something about sin, it's going to grow. That's that leaven principle that's all through the scriptures. But the Messiah gave us the example, so we need to follow his example. Reprove your brethren privately. So if someone causes you a damage, you go to them one on one first, right? Reprove your brethren with a witness. If they damage you and they don't hear you the first time, bring one or two witnesses to, to speak to them. All right? But if he will not hear you, then take with you one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And then finally, reprove your brethren at church. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it to the church. What does church mean? Ecclesia. Ecclesia. It's a calling out a congregation assembly church. You guys know what I think it is. It's the congregation of the Lord in the tabernacle. Stephen mentioned the ecclesia in the wilderness. The word ecclesia in the Septuagint is referring to the congregation of the Lord, the, the judicial system, the rulers of Israel. Well, what, what he's saying is try and settle out of court. If someone causes you a damage, try and rectify it out of court. You don't just deal with it one on one. If they don't receive that first one, bring one more person and see. And then go to court, go to church, go to ecclesia. If they receive your reproof, they can repent. That's the whole point to this. So there's repentance. Strong's Dictionary, repent, means to sigh, breathe strongly, to be sorry for. Metaneo is the Greek, to think differently or afterwards reconsider. It's a thought process. But that thought process always leads to change. If you've truly repented, you're eventually going to change. We are supposed to have a continual mindset of repentance. Each individual shall confess their sins. It's funny, in the Old Testament, confession was over an animal sacrifice. Speaking of the children of Israel, when a man or woman commits sin, they, and they shall confess their sin which they have done, always at the tab tabernacle. How does that rectify with the New Testament? Follow the Messiah's example. Reprove your brother privately. If they confess and repent, then the problem is solved. Reprove your brother with a witness. If they confess and repent, then the problem is solved. Reprove your brother in court or church. If found guilty, they will confess and offer a sacrifice. Okay? This is settling out of court. That's what God wants us to do. We don't... I mean, the perfect law of liberty means, hey, if someone... Re and I should have put this verse up there, but there's a proverb that says, re receive reproof with kindness. If I've done something wrong to Chauncey or David or somebody, and they correct me, I should receive it with kindness, with a smile on my face. Really, I didn't mean to do that. And then we should be able to solve it without having to go to some authority. That's what we should be able to do. But, you know, the reality is we, we can't. 1 Corinthians 13, we were talking about that a while. Love, it, it says... Uh, Love is not easily offended. Love it has thick skin. Yes. So when someone reproves you, you shouldn't get mad. We should never, we, we need thick skin in the church today. The nation shall confess their sins as well. Sometimes we get caught up into national sin. Nehemiah did that so they read in the book of the law that they were supposed to do all these things they weren't. And all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. We need this to happen in America today. Amen. This is what needs to happen. It needs to happen with one of our rulers or governors or something. And then what they do, and then they kept the feast seven days. So they learned, they repented, changed their mind, they were sorry, then all of a sudden they changed. Uh, I'm hoping something like that happens in America because you can see there's a revival of God's law. Yeah. You're hearing more and more about it. The church is waking up in America to God's law. God will show grace and restore those who repent. He does it every single time. If they shall confess their iniquity, then will I remember my covenant with Jacob and Isaac and, and Abraham. So he'll remember his covenant with us if we repent. So some sins are judged by the Levitical priesthood. Some sins are acts of God, which are natural consequences. This is the last seven. Remember the 21 statutes I put up there? An act of God was what? This phrase denotes those accidents which arise from physical causes and which cannot be prevented. Under the term act of God are comprehended all misfortunes and accidents arising from inevitable necessity which human prudence could not foresee or prevent. One of the punishments was they will die childless. I don't see how a court system can handle that one. 
And if a man shall lie with his uncle, it has to do with incest, with his uncle's wife. They shall die childless. They shall die childless. God has to control this. I can't think of how a court system would handle this one. I don't know. Maybe with modern technology they can. <laughs> Or a rotted thigh and a swelled belly. This is a specific punishment when you suspect your wife of infidelity. Now we'll talk more about that when it comes up. And I'm just going to tell you right now, I have no idea what it means. But that's something God has to do. You know, there's no way. I don't think the court system handed that out. Maybe there's a natural consequence. I'm hoping God will help me understand that better <laughs> before it comes up. Uh, the remainder are national punishments. Disease and pestilence, I will put none of these diseases upon you, which they brought upon the Egyptians. It's a national consequence. Okay, the consumption and the burning ague, those are some of the, the diseases he will bring upon us. This is a national curse, it's not individual. Disease comes from what? There's two ways you can get disease. Poison or starvation. Have you ever thought of it that way? You're either poisoned or starving from something. You either have a toxin that's causing a problem, or you're missing a nutrient that's causing a problem. For example, scurvy was missing vitamin C. They solved it by giving them limes. Right? That's starvation. We're starving from a nutrient. Poison would be like vaccine injuries. I don't know if you're into that or not, but they actually pay you out for injuries from vaccines. You put a toxin in, it might cause a problem. Those disease is only that. And it's from breaking God's health laws. Poor sanitation, poor food regulation, poor agricultural practices. If we're sanitizing correctly, like God says, we won't get those toxins. If we're doing the food regulations correctly, we're going to have good food. Poor agricultural practices. Our land is not healthy anymore. Because we don't keep the land Sabbath. Job received several curses though. And he was righteous. Why? See, it's not individual. It's, it's national. America is receiving this right now. And sometimes you might get it, sometimes you won't. Because there's no way we could have good soil in America right now unless you're doing it all yourself. But God works all things for good to those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. So if we get one of these national curses, even as a believer, God will work it out to good. I'm convinced of that. I'm convinced of that. It doesn't mean we're uh, immune from it. And there's probably steps we can try and take to avoid it. But this is a national problem. And it's really hard to avoid it because just our food is not entirely healthy today. And I got some stats for that in a minute. But what God thought to do to them, He will do to you. This is a national consequence also. But if you will not drive out the inhabitants of the land before you, when dealing with war, God expects you to handle it correctly. He says, I will do unto you as I thought to do unto them. And then there's loss of blessing and you shall be cursed. Um, God has several curses and several blessings that he has for us. We can lose them or we can gain the curses. So when a nation is in sin, God will send a prophet. I found six statutes for prophets. The role of a prophet is what? We look at this purely religious. I'm going to try not to. They proclaim God's word. They reveal God's plan. He reveals his secret unto his servants, the prophets. Prophets are to keep us in his ways. Bring them again unto the Lord. That's their job. And prophecy is a gift given to the church, the ecclesia. All right, they're gifts that we have. Okay, God will speak to prophets with visions and with dreams. So that's one of the ways God will speak to them. Who are the prophets today, though? You shall test the prophets. How shall we know the, Lord, the, the word which the Lord has not spoken? We're supposed to test them. And here's how to test a prophet. One, what he says will come to pass if what they say is coming to pass. We know it's a prophet of God. They are faithful. That means they will walk after the Lord your God and fear Him and keep His commandments. They will exalt the Messiah. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And they will keep the commandments. 
to the law and to the testimony. If they, keep, they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. If the prophet is proven false, do not listen to him. If the thing follow not, nor come to pass, thou shalt not be afraid of him. And false prophets shall be put to death. We don't do that. We have a lot of people spouting off a lot of things without backing it up. And if we did that, people would stop talking. <laughs> you shall listen to the prophets among your brethren that the Lord raises up. So if you test them and they come true, we should listen. Who are prophets today? Well, I'm not thinking religious. Who's trying to correct America today? Well, an honorable pastor would be, right? Well, an honorable pastor would be. Yeah. Donald Trump? <laughs> <laughs> you know what, some of the, and I don't know if this is true or not, some of the guys that have been trying to correct America, I think of guys like Ron Paul. He's absolutely right, and his is a very biblical commandment-based correction in America. Going back to the gold standard, fixing our monetary system, most of what he says that I know of is true. Is he correcting America? Is he right? I don't think the mainstream church is who we're talking about. Not at all. I really don't. I, I, so I don't know if that's right or not. That's where my brain kind of goes. It's probably what David said, to be honest. Um, if, if his series right now were blasted across America, wouldn't that be amazing? The, the law, faith, and grace. I, I often struggle with understanding where prophets fit in America today. It's, it's probably an honorable pastor, which we have very little of them today. Uh, my mind goes to people in government that are believers, that are seriously trying to make things right. I, I mentioned Ron Paul only because I think he nailed the biggest problem in America. And no one's been listening to him for decades. And he's done so much to fix it, but still no one listens to him. He, he definitely got that one right. If we don't listen and repent, then God will send us curses. So if we don't listen to the prophets trying to correct us, He will send us curses. Remember, the rise and fall of every nation is based on our obedience to God's law. Here's some of the curses. There's 31 blessings that are counted and 34 curses. Alright, blessings and curses. God will covenant with us. I split these up into like four different groups. Because there's a lot of them. This, the Deuteronomy stuff. this is Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28. I will establish my covenant with you. God established his covenant with America. I will be your God and you will be my people. That was true of America when we started. I will set my tabernacle among you. He will set his judicial system and his laws among us. My soul shall not abhor you. You will be set above all nations on the earth. That happened to America. Very quickly, I might add. You will be a holy people to God. You shall be the head and not the tail in all that you do. When we breach the covenant, we receive curses. God will destroy our court system. All the high places. If you remember that from the Levitical priesthood part. That's our lower court system. God will destroy our sanctuaries, the Supreme Court. That's the federal court system. God will cut down our images, our contracts with these people, with these gods. God will reject our way of worship. I'm not entirely sure what that means, but it, I think it relates more to our legal system than uh, what we call worship today. If we do not repent, God will punish us seven times more. Okay? You can kind of see where America falls on a lot of these. There are health ones as well. God will take sickness away from us. You will inherit the land. We don't own any land in America anymore, by the way. You will have rain in due season. We get drought in due season, like every seven years or so, or they last like seven years. The land shall yield her increase. The trees of the field shall yield their fruit. There will be no famine or shortages. Do we have a water shortage still or are we out of that? We're out of that now. But we've been getting some of that. All of your days, 70 years, shall be fulfilled. And that's a hard one for me. I can't get around, you know, when, when, when it says, There shall nothing cast their young, nor be barren in thy land. The number of your days I will fulfill. If you study it with the process I use, in the Psalms, David said the number of your days are 70 years. 
So God is saying, I will give you 70 years of life if you're obedient to me. Well, our national average is 75. We're, we're, kind, of average, a, we're kind of about right. And I just have a hard time getting around that. I don't want to say that. You sound like you have a better explanation. No, no, I was saying we're, we're, we're like over 80 now. Oh, are we over 80? So we're, I mean, it's hard to believe we're rising in that. I think we're getting more curses. Maybe let's say four score. Four score. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, oh, yeah, 80 if you're strong. 70 or, or 80 if you're yeah. strong, you're right. So uh, I, I don't know. People don't like it when I say it that way, but I think God's promising us a long life in this. And, um, you know, we got that. But then the curses come when we're disobedient. We get disease and sickness. God will appoint diseases over us. I think that's happening in America. It's rising like crazy. Uh, heaven and earth will be unyielding. That means our fruit and our crops will not be growing. Uh, God will curse our bread production. When I have broken the staff of your bread, you will not be satisfied. That's one of my favorite verses. I'm going to go over that in just a minute. God will curse our food production and our storehouses. Cursed shall be thy basket and thy store. God will curse our children. Cursed shall be the fruit of your body. God will curse our livestock. You will sow your seed in vain. And God will give us insanity and blindness. These are all the curses related to health. Doesn't sound good, does it? Some statistics. The CDC, there was an article in Medscape magazine, U.S. death rates rise for many leading diseases. You can find articles all over the place how the rise of disease in America is, is pretty amazing. Our soil is depleted of minerals. Look at this chart from the Nutrition Security Institute. They tested from 1914 to 1997. Calcium, magnesium, and iron they tested in cabbage, lettuce, tomatoes, and spinach. These mineral counts went from 400, whatever measurement, they, milligrams, all the way down to about 75. Do you think that's affecting our health? This is directly related to the land Sabbath. The, the, I wish I should have grabbed the study, but the Jews did a study on this. If you give your land rest, they did it in a lab. If you give your land rest every seven years, your mineral count actually rises. Okay, we, don't do that. we don't do that. And we've never done that. And we wonder why we're getting sicker and sicker and sicker. And we look at you know poison and starvation as, as really that's all the diseases that there are. This is starvation. Our body is starving for minerals. You would have to eat like eight apples to get the same mineral content as what I had as a kid. And that's sad to think about. So that's what I mean. These are national consequences. Because there's not a whole lot we can do about this. Unless you're going to grow your own food and start keeping the land Sabbath yourself. So you were a kid in 1948? No, but I was just... <laughs> you're ruining... It just flows better that way. My, when, my, when, when my dad was a kid. Is that better? <laughs> he was born in the 40s. <laughs> But still, that wasn't you know, uh, long enough ago. Uh, the CDC recommends a three-day supply of food. That's actually our national average. They, 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 they say that um, every supermarket has a three-day supply of food. Is that enough? You know, 50 years ago, every household had a year's supply of food. It was just common. It was just regular practice. We don't do that today. Serious birth defects are on the rise, the CDC researcher says as well. Um, and this one's one of my favorite, bread production. When I saw this and just made this connection, look what this verse says. And when I have broken the staff of your bread, the staff is what holds it up. It's the nutrients of your bread. Ten women shall bake your bread in one oven. Sound like Wonder White Bread yet? <laughs> and they shall deliver you your bread again by weight. Delivered all across the nation in the same package by weight. And you shall eat and not be satisfied or nutritious. White bread is completely useless. Yeah. Completely useless, and that's what we're doing. This is a curse from God. Turns into sugar in your body. It's a, it, it's it's a waste. It's the bad carbs they're talking about. Yeah. Um, I, I, it's not written in our modern language, but I'm quite sure that's what we're doing. <laughs> so if you look at these, I would pretty much say we're reaping all of these curses. Just about every single one is falling on America in one way or another. Uh, then God also promised us protection. He said, you will dwell in your land safely. I will give you peace in the land. 
I will rid evil beasts from the land. You shall have no war in your land. You shall chase your enemies. Your enemies shall fall before you by the sword. All the people of the earth will be afraid of you. The curse, we will reap what we sow. God's protection will be gone. God will appoint terrorists over us. I will even appoint over you terror. That one's pretty real and literal today. You will be slain by your enemies. And I will set my face against you. You shall be slain before your enemies. God will destroy our national pride. Have we lost national pride in America? Any patriots out there? Patriotism is not really readily available in America today. A foreign nation shall besiege your cities. You shall be left few in number. God will bring us to national captivity. The good thing is our king will go into national captivity with us. <laughs> and God will bring fear upon those in captivity. So they will be fearful when they're in captivity. And other nations shall be astonished at the, the destruction of your nation. We haven't reaped all of these yet. But we have some of them. God will appoint terrorists over us. I think that one's true. God will destroy our national pride. I think he's in the process of doing that. I don't know about you, but I, I've always been very proud of America. Just its godly heritage. Remember that law, public law 97280 I wrote up there? Or I put up there? Just reading that brings tears to my eyes that we used to think like that. Uh, I will give you peace in the land. We really don't have that now that, you know, after 9-11 or... Uh, you know, some of the terrorist attacks that we've had. I will rid evil beasts from the land. You know, we are actually writing laws to protect evil beasts in America. Yeah. We are doing that. We should have the right to rid them from our land. Mm -hmm. Why not? Why can't I protect my chickens from a coyote? I should be able to do that. But we're actually protecting them now. You shall chase your enemies. I hate to say it, but our other nations are no longer afraid of America. And that's the last one. All the people of the earth will be afraid of you. They are not. They're, they're, they're boldly right. taunting us. This is all changing right before our eyes and we don't recognize it. Our wealth. Your stores of goods shall not run out. I will have respect to you. I will make you fruitful and multiply. You shall gain great wealth. Blessed shall be the fruit of your body. Blessed shall be the fruit of your cattle. You shall be blessed in the city. And blessed shall you be when you come in or go out. That's referring to business, I think. You shall be blessed in everything you do. And you shall lend but not borrow. Poverty is what comes with the curses. God will curse our business, unemployment. We've been talking about unemployment a lot recently. Uh, God will send wild beasts to destroy our children and livestock. Your crops will be consumed. God will appoint cannibalism. That one scares me. Um, I would not look forward to the time when we're eating our children. That hasn't happened in America, thank goodness. Adultery will be rampant. That might be, we, that, they might be onto something there. That, your children will be given to another people. Your money will fail and you will borrow and not lend. Look what our national debt, this is a chart from our national debt since we got rid of the gold standard. Yeah. Like the 40s are time to be alive. No, well, well yeah, it was actually... Slightly before that, but we adopted, we got rid of the gold standard in 1933, I think it was. And yeah, you can, you, that, you can just see. It's like 17 now, isn't it? I'm sure it is, but I do all only public domain images, so I had to, it's, it, you're limited in what pictures you can use. God will make our cities a wasteland. I don't know if that's entirely happened yet. <laughs> God will bring our land to desolation, and the foreigners will rise up above you. These are all the curses I could find and all the blessings. I would say adultery being rampant is pretty, uh, pretty prevalent in America. Your money will fail and you will borrow. We're, we're a debtor nation yeah. by a long shot now. I will make you fruitful and multiply you. I'm living proof. I've only got two kids. 
That's very, I mean, 100 years ago, people had 10, 12, 15. You know, it, it's just not very common today. God's not making us fruitful and multiplying us. And they, yeah, that's, that's what's happening. The stranger's rising up. You shall gain great wealth. No, we're not wealthy in America today. We're all in debt. Blessed shall be the fruit of your cattle. I should have grabbed a statistic, but our animal production today, the way we're raising our animals and our cattle is not healthy, is not good. Uh, they call it mad cow disease. We have that rampant in America. We just call it downer cow syndrome. Yeah. Same thing. It's the exact same disease. It's okay because we don't call it mad cow disease. You shall lend but not borrow. So all of these are happening to America today. So you shall not take the name of God in vain. This is not swearing. This is ambassadorship. When America was founded, we took our ambassadorship serious. We really did. We were receiving all the blessings. In 150 years, 13 colonies became the wealthiest and most powerful nation in the world. This was done by obedience to God's law. Only 115 years, we started with 13 colonies. Question, does America take our ambassadorship serious now? We don't even acknowledge we're a, a Christian or biblical nation anymore. We've, we've almost committed that blasphemy. We're turning away saying we want something else as a nation. Not us, but as a nation. We've almost committed, you know, we're breaking this commandment. I mean, we're, we're right on that line, I'd say, because we're literally denying it and going somewhere else. Yeah, that, that, that's what they say. I think our Supreme Court said our religion today is secular humanism. Right. They're just stating the facts. I'm not knocking the Supreme Court for that. They're just saying that. Uh, in less than 50 years, America has gone from the leading creditor nation to the leading debtor nation. This is done by disobedience to God's law. I only went through 20 of the punishments. The last one is obvious. It's the lake of fire. If we don't make that decision today, that's the final punishment. The last act that God's going to make and it's His punishment on everybody for disobedience. <laughs>